everybody. Uh, uh, it's great to be here again. Another conch, old friends, new friends. Great to see you all here. And my name is Wilker. I work for Newbank. And today my talk is on the Maximo graph. There are some ideas about how we can connect data and uh, supply some rich demands on these days. And I'm going to tell you my story on this, on how I get there. It's going to go through the years. And this story starts in 2016. And at this year, I was working primarily with Ruby on Rails on my full-time job. But I was also already exploring ClojureScript and React. Uh, and I really like the way React creates these rich user interfaces. I really like the result of that. But working on Ruby on Rails used to be much easier to deal about, especially regarding the data fetching story. In the data fetching story for a Rails app, which is uh, similar to any server-side rendering app you may get, is that you do something like this, right? You have a browser. The browser issues a request to the server. The server parses the input, generates some HTML, and you get that back to the browser. And all the browser has to do is render the thing. So it's kind of a dummy thing. Uh, dummy browser doesn't have to do much. And Looking a little bit uh, closer to this step, I like to see that the communication between the client and the server is pretty much this URL you are sending to them, right? Uh, and that URL is usually good enough to specify what, uh, what representative are you talking about in your system. And in the case of Rails, it used to be like a row into a table on your database. Um, and then we have a controller that will parse that input, like get the user to uh, get to a model, and it's going to send that model to a render template. And there is two things that I like to separate at this point. There, are, there is the which, that is, what is the record? What's the representative I'm talking about now? And there is the what, and the what is, what about that representative I'm going to use? In the case of Rails, and because you are living in the same box, uh, the, uh, the which passes like this rich model to the, to the render template. So using that, that model can read uh, static properties from the customer table. You also have some computed properties that usually some, uh, some methods that you just added to your class that you can call there. And there's also related resources. And what's nice in this approach is that the render template have the full access on that model. So Whatever it needs to take, it can ask right there, and it gets it. And also, if you remove something, for example, it's, it, you already stop processing that, because they are that tied. So just to clear up this distinction between which and what. Which is what I'm referencing, like what, what are the entity or entities that I'm talking about in this system? And that can be one or many. And the what is what I'm getting about that entity. And in my experience, most of this is like stored data, computed data, and related entities. And it was working all good, fine and dandy on the rest, uh, on the server-side rendering thing. But then, when you move to React in these rich clients, now you are in a different situation. You have something like more, that's more like this, where you get the input, you process the output, but now you speak data. Now your render template is living in a different box than your server. And as a consequence of that, now you have what in two places. Because the browser uh, is the one that has the source of truth. He's the one who knows what needs to be rendered. But because you are using a data language to transmit their information, the server also has to decide what needs to be there. And now you have these things that are kind of out of sync. And like every time you mess with the render template, you have to change the server as well. And this problem gets greatly aggravated as you add extra clients to this, because your mobile client will have a different demand than your server, than your browser. And you can add a tab tablet thing, and that's going to be a even a different one. And this is just for a single endpoint. Your application probably has dozens of those endpoints, and all these endpoints suffer from this same issue. So simplifying, the, the REST architecture here is complexing which and what. The clients only say which, but they also need to, to tell what. 
And that was the same year that David Nolan gave the presentation on demand-driven architecture, uh, in which they talk a lot about the same problems I'm discussing here. There is the clients need a, a, to specify a rich demand to the server to fulfill their needs. And REST was not doing so good on that. So I, I find it quite nice that they set some principles for DDA for dealing with these kinds of situations. And the first principle is demand. That means that the client must be able to specify exactly what it needs. Uh, in the way we just talk about to be the which and the what. There is also a need for composition because parts of your what may be related to different entities. And from those different entities, you also need to specify the what on them. So you get this composition that is a recursive property. And the third principle he adds there is about interpretation. That means whatever this language is, whatever this communication we are doing is, it needs to be interpreted on the server. It's not good if we tie that to a single implementation or a single database. It needs to be able to go around. And another, a lot of companies that were having this problem back then, like Facebook. So Facebook came up with GraphQL as a solution to this problem. And GraphQL is a custom language that has a typed schema and supports introspection. And that's a feature a lot of developers like. Because on the REST world, you, you can just hope the guy gives you a good documentation. But in GraphQL, because that's in kind of enforced type schema, you can always go to a GraphQL and say, tell me what you have. And this enables autocomplete and these cool introspection features. Let's see how we could solve our previous problem that you just described using GraphQL. If you do that with GraphQL, first you define a schema. And that schema is pretty much your full interface, like what my service is providing, it's there. And with that in hand, we can have a query for the desktop request, the desktop demand, that's like this. And if we follow this query, you're going to see that first, there is a witch on the beginning saying, hey, I'm talking about the customer two here. And then there is the what means, I want all these properties about this customer. And then the order itself is another witch, because now it's pointing to a collection of orders. And from each order, I want this. So this is the composition, recursive composition property that GraphQL does. And when you have the other clients like mobile, the mobile can just specify what you want. And the same goes for a tablet. And this, this gets you these good decomplected things about. Now the server can just say, I have all of these available. And the client can say, OK, I want this piece, this piece, and that piece. And that's, uh, and that's quite nice. So what about closure? Uh, do you have something similar that can handle these kinds of things in closure? And back then, things like the datomic post syntax is a good candidate. If you read the description, it says, post syntax is a declarative way to make hierarchical and possibly nested selections on information entities. OK, sounds promising. So let's see how we could write a query in the same way we did the GraphQL, but for in, in, in the atomic post syntax. And we can write like this. So the same thing, we have the which points to the resource. We have the what pulling the items. We have a connection to another which. And we have another what inside. Good. So let's, let's follow the post syntax and the demand-driven architecture idea. Demand, check. Composition, check. Interpretation, not so much. Because GraphQL, uh, the post syntax is tied to the datomic implementation. It's not actually an extensible thing. So although it seems like a good path, we still had more work to do on top of that. And at this point, we, had to, we could make a decision on we could do something like the GraphQL and try to create a type system on Clojure. That's totally possible. But Clojure loves properties. And uh, I think that's an interesting approach to take it. And just to affirm it that, for example, in the Atomic, you, you never define where a customer is. You never define where an order is. Instead, you just define the attributes you want. And that's, that's all we need. You can do queries. You can do a lot of things on top of that. The same goes for spec. Uh, who was, remember, like, just when Respect was released, everybody was like, oh, I want to do it like my schema, where I put my key and my value. And Spark was like, no, you define your properties first, 
and then you combine them with S keys. And although in, at start, it's kind of, uh, you're like, when you understand the value that brings, I think it's really powerful because then you can just reference, you decomplex the properties on itself from the structure it is. And then comes a question like, okay, but if we go in that direction, can we have introspection, the cool, the cool features that GraphQL does? Maybe, let's see. So a quick summary of just just saw. Uh, REST clients move the what part of a request to a different box, and REST fails to deal with the rich demands. The main driven architecture provides a path to handle these new rich demands. GraphQL has emerged as a popular way to handle these rich demands. But as everything else work with, what happens if we try to sprinkle some closure ideas and properties on top of that? What gets out? And jump to the next year. That's the year I joined Newbank, so I can finally work full time on closure. Don't have to deal with so much with Ruby on Rails. That's nice. And uh, that was also the year that I was exploring these ideas. And on next was the precursor that uh, set the foundation on the closure side. And, uh, but back there, there wasn't much, right? Uh, there is no documentation, no, no way to handle, so we have to figure that out. And in the process, I wrote this library called Patton. And Patton is pretty much my library that can pr process that pool like syntax. And another important thing to mention is that um, there was also Fulcro starting, and Tony K is around here. If you want to talk all about Fulcro, check there, check him. So uh, in the, during this time, Onyx got stuck, but Fulcro has been evolving since then. So if you are going to do a UI, I suggest you start with Fulcro. And if you want to know more, there will be a talk on Fulcro, just two talks after this one. You can check that out. And at Newbank, there was this project called Shuffle, and I, I was trying to get these ideas out, right? And Shuffle is the back office product at Newbank. This is how we see all the customer information when someone is doing customer support. So what they see is a screen like this. Like this is our call BO, that's like an information, all the information from a customer. And as you can see, this, this has a very complicated uh, demand for data. Because potentially, every widget you are seeing demands data from a different service. Because Newbank is a microservice architecture, so this data is all spread all around. And this particular UI needs to know everything that's related to the customer service. And after some talks and discussions, we decided to give it a go and try to see if that would work for us. And we decided to start playing around. And most of the experience that I'm going to tell you about was building this system and trying to get these ideas rolling. Uh, in 2018, uh, we had the, we created this EQL because we had this datomic pool syntax extension. Fulcro was using it, Python was using it, but we don't have no name. So we created a name just to make it easy. So EQL is the GraphQL counterpart. It just defines the syntax of the things. And to give a quick comparison, let's take a look on some syntax, synthetic features from GraphQL and EQL. And this, the first example is empty queries. So on the left side, you see the EQL empty query, that's a vector. And on the right side, you see the GraphQL query, which is a string there. And that's the first thing to notice. If you are in a closure world, EQL is just data, it's just eaten. You can manipulate as much as you want. And the next thing is that properties. That's the simplest thing. Uh, properties in EQL are expressed with keywords. And in GraphQL, you just type that. There are the concept of joins. That means when you are pointing, referencing a lot of relationship, you want to tell something about it. So a join is a way to express that. And every time I say join this talk, this is what I'm referring to. Also, both of them support parameters. And that's the first time you see a distinction from the post syntax. This is not on the post syntax. But it's a very nice property because that adds an extra, an extra dimension of information that you can send about how you want that property. And in a case of a list like this, you can use like first 10. So just get me the 10 first items. Uh, both of them have support for mutations. That's like the right side of the API. But this talk is really focusing on the read side. So that's all I'm going to talk about this. Now, some interesting things that GraphQL have and that EQL doesn't have but for a good reason, and you're gonna see why. The first one uh, is like enums. 
It's a feature to limit things, but in, in Clojure, you can just write a, um, a spec that says all these items are there. If you just respect the, the keyword namespace, you can get autocomplete on your editor that is as efficient, in my opinion. The next thing is like variables. Because GraphQL is treated like a text-based thing on most places, like if you use with uh, Apollo JavaScript or anything, uh, and you don't know, you can't interpolate strings less concatenating them because then you will open yourself for injections and all these things. But in Clojure, you don't need that because EQL is just data, so just write a function and place it on there. It's not going to enable an injection of any sort. Fragments is something similar. Uh, it's a specialization of that, but for subqueries. And again, just make a def, and you are good to go. And you can just put it there. And the other one, that's where this language starts to get weird because you are doing this text thing. You know, and now you say, oh, but I, I want an if here. And you implement that directive and you start evolving that language to support until like you are in a Turing complete language again. And in Clojure, again, just, just use Clojure. Use if, the if from Clojure. Use the for loops from Clojure, like data, data in, data out, it doesn't matter. So now let's talk a bit about interpretation. Like uh, how, how uh, we process that. And first, some mindset differences. In GraphQL, we have types. In EQL, we have properties. And in GraphQL, closed and open world. Just keep that in mind for now. So let's see how GraphQL would interpret that query with the schema with the things. And since we are in a closure con uh, conference, I will use Lacinia as the example. So to convert this schema to a Lacinia schema, that's the most popular GraphQL implementation on Clojure, you write something like this. And that should define the schema. And there are these resolve keys. And these resolve keys, you put a map there, and then you map that map, that key to a function, and that's how it runs. And if we were to define that same schema with EQL and Patton, how would you do it? Well, just write the specs. Actually, in the pattern sense, you don't even need the specs, but I think they are great to have because they can inform your, your users about what they expect there. But the resolvers is where they diverge a lot. Resolvers in pattern are these edges on a graph. And what they do is they connect properties. So the, the properties enter the system in the time you, you add the resolver to the system. So you can say, oh, I have a resolver here that if you can give me a customer ID, I can give you this data. Or if you give me orders, I can give you this data. And that's how you build up the system. So just recap, in Python, the resolvers represent edges connecting properties. Uh, in the case of Python, uh, resolvers are maps. So they are simple to understand, mix, generate, anything you want. And, and the resolvers enable that Auto, auto complete, uh, efficient auto complete contextual thing. We can have that as well, and we do have already. Now, talking a bit about execution, how these things run. So, in the GraphQL side, you start processing like this. So, you're going to see this first step. This is going to trigger that resolver from GraphQL. It's going to call that function. So, read from memory, read from memory, call a new resolver, read from memory, read from memory. And you finish the fulfilling the request. In EQL, we do things a little bit different because on that join part, that lookup ref you see there, it's not doing anything. It's just that saying to the next step to say, oh, hey, I have a customer ID available. That's all. And then it gets to the name. It says, oh, yeah, name can be fetched from that resolver. So I just call that. And now you have that data in memory. The DOB is there. And same goes for the others until you finish fulfilling that. In a very Tiny difference about them, let's do a bit twist. Let's just remove the user data you want. We don't want anything from the user, we just want the orders, actually. In the GraphQL case, because the join is realized there, you call that resolver anyway, even, you, even that you don't use any data from it, which doesn't happen on EQL because that just sets the context. So the only resolver is going to be triggered here is the orders one. And that may seem a small thing, but as you compose things, this allows you to don't have to define ahead of time what is the base user or base anything. It's just going to fulfill whatever you, you need to be fulfilled. And now I'm going to start talking about some techniques that, uh, that emerge from when we're modeling like this. 
The first thing that you probably didn't notice, but that's totally fine, is that we don't have that in our schema. We don't have the relationship between order to customer. And if you look with attention, when our resolver for orders, we actually have a customer ID there. That's the same property we're seeing before. Because by having the customer ID there, that can link on the customer ID on the other guy. Which means that if you are processing orders, you can ask for customer name because uh, Patton will be able to traverse the graph and find this for you. And when you are in a UI, that can compound to multiple entities. Every two one relationship can now be flattened in the same context. And this makes more much more easy on your UI on wherever client you want to fetch that data. You don't need to know about the middle steps. You can cut that out. Another interesting thing is globals. GraphQL there has the concept of root types. And when you are on the root, you can, I can only ask what's on the root type. But in Python, since there is no types or anything like that, if you define a resolver that has no inputs, we call that a global. Because if you don't need anything, you can ask it anywhere, right? It should not matter. So you can ask this at a root like this, but you can also ask in any depth level of your query. I mean, if you don't need anything, why not? Another thing is placeholders, and that's like the opposite of flattening. Because on the flattening, we get this uh, that deep structure and try to flatten it out. But sometimes your UI will require structure. For example, here in this UI, every widget uh, is about the customer representative. But the dashboard that is containing that is also about the same customer, right? Because UIs are trees, so you compose from top down. To simplify this, imagine that you have two components for the customer. One is the customer view and another birthday view. And then you want to compose those in something else. The problem is, what's the which here? Because really, the which here is the same thing. I don't want you to change. Wherever the customer was in that customer dashboard, it should be the same one on customer name and customer in birthday view. So our solution to this is we make a special namespace that's greater than, and that's configurable in Python. But if you do that, what you're telling Python is that, oh, OK, I see the special namespace, so you just want a link to yourself. So this enables you to restructure your whole data at query time without the server having to need to know about it. And this en enhances the decomplexion thing for the main driven. We also have GraphQL integration because GraphQL is introspectable. So what I can do is you can download the GraphQL schema and just inject it there. And if we just do it directly like we did before, we end up in the same situation we just saw. But one thing that we do is we also add prefixes. Because prefixes are good because they can resolve the problem of collision of names. Imagine if you try to import two, three, four GraphQL APIs. Every one of them may want to have a, their own customer, their own thing. So by prefixing it, you separate the names. So now we can see what you're talking about. We also have this concept of query root mapping because, as I said, GraphQL has to be accessed from the roots. But there is no roots here. So we just create this map. And this map does the mapping between the root entities. So you can run queries in the EQL style. And it will know how to convert that to GraphQL. Yeah, as you can see there. So property alias. That's, uh, that's a cool one. This is a real example. In Newbank, in, our, in that back office thing, we actually have two GraphQL APIs imported from other from other, uh, other teams at Newbank. And one of them is called Storm Shield, and the other one is called Mancini. So when important prefix, now you have that situation where you have Storm Shield customer ID and you have Mancini customer ID. But really, because you want the system, you know that actually these are just customer IDs, all of them. So what you do to fix this is just you create an alias. And an alias is just a resolver that we just rename. We just get one name and put the same value on another name. And by doing that, you can run a query like this, customer ID 2, and get me the storm shoot thing. Because the graph can traverse from one to the other and get the data you want. And this is such a common operation that we actually have a helper there. You can call alias resolver. And because resolvers are maps, it returns a map that has that resolver implemented on it. And you can do one for each. And alias are directional, right? Because you just give a bridge from the left side to the right side. But in this case, this should be bidirectional. Because if I see a Mancini customer ID, I should be able to use anything for customer ID as well. So you can add extra aliases to do the other direction. Or you can use 
alias two, that's just the bidirectional version. It just can create both. So it's worth noticing that in EQL, the properties are your read API. Every time you define a property, that's an entry point to your system. And not just your system, for your whole composition of data. Every property can be hooked up on as an input for something else. And sorry about all this code mesh. So to ease our minds a little bit, this is my mother's dog. It's called Mel. <laughs> A breath, and let's continue. So, in the in the Shuffle project, uh, Shuffle is the front end side, and we have to have a service that's the back end side, and that's Abrams. That's how we call it. And Abrams is started as something like this, right? There's Shuffle calling it. It called few REST services, but then we add more REST services. Then we add GraphQL services that talk to REST services, and then we add extra clients to it because why not? And one cool example is about that counter spell. They used Abrams to do template rendering. Instead of trying to know how to call every service, they just put the keywords on the template. And from that, they generate an EQL query that goes to Abrams and fulfill the data for them. So that saved a ton of work. So in the current state, I want to give you an idea of the size of the things we are dealing with here. So Abrams is connected to 66 different services, from which two are GraphQLs. Uh, calling 177 different endpoints with 429 resolvers in total. We're using considering alias and internal processing. That is 1,813 properties. It's probably, and it grows by the day. It's probably higher right now. And 101 mutations calling things on their services. So let's go to 2019. This current year, what's going on now? And that was the year that I actually learned more about RDF and the semantic web. Uh, I have here Hichi talk about on this talk, so Clojure seems to have a lot of inspiration on it. But I really, I didn't understand it at all. I have no idea what this was about. So someone at uh, Paul, uh, Paul, sorry, I don't remember his last name, recommended me this book. And he said, oh yeah, I wanna know more about RDF. Okay, I'm gonna read that book. And I learned a bunch of things. RDF is actually a lot of stuff. If you go deep on RDF, RDFS, all, all sparkle. But for now, let's just talk about the simplest thing it has. There is a triplet store. And have a, do you know about triplet stores? If you know the atomic, eh, you know something that's close to that. It's a quadruple store. But for the sake of comparison here, I'm going to take the last part out. And in our, so you have the triplet that is entity value attribute. So that's how you represent facts and data in the atomic. And that's how RDF represents data as well, but they just call it different. They call it subject, property, and object. But same concept. And another very important thing that I learned from that book was the AAA slogan. Because these guys, they're trying to make an information system, a uh, fact uh, data system that can work for the whole internet. So how can you model something like this? So the AA slogan says, anyone can say anything about any topic. Whoa, seems a bold statement. How can that work? So in RDF, the way they, they approach to fix this problem is that every resource of the subject must be a fully qualified URL. Because this way, if you have your company and you have your customer one, two, three, you're going to put your URL first. And that goes for any data, like in properties, the, the second part of the triplet is also a resource, and that means two things. One, they, are, they try to be unambiguous as much as you can because of the long names, but also you can talk stuff about the property. The property is an entity on itself, and that gets some meta levels of, of things you can describe about your system and your properties. What about AAA enclosure? To me, right now, it sums you what's the name, what's the size of your namespace, right? If you write a keyword like ID, the chances that this ID property will collide with some other ID because someone invented it is really high. Even yourself, yourself is gonna hit yourself on the foot with this one because it's so short. But if you use something like customer ID, you are in a much better place. And I think because of Datomic, this is what most companies are doing. Because in internal, in a local context, that's, that's uh, meaningful enough. There are not going to be multiple customer IDs on, on your system. But if you just add one more, like new bank customer ID, now that's super specific. 
like the odds of your colliding with any system in the world had fall dramatically. How many new bank companies are in the world that will use that name and will clash by accident? Very little. So think about that when you model your properties if you want then to talk to the world. Uh, as bigger you get, as reduce the chance of collision. And I'm really, uh, really look forward to uh, the issue on the closure JIRA, that's the CLJ2123. And that issue is about having a lightweight way to name properties. Because I really want to use long names. I want to use names that don't collide. But right now, you have to create the namespace to actually alias it. Because I want to use the names or I don't want to type them. So it would be great to have that. And if you are the idea, maybe upvote that can get prioritized. I'm not sure. <laughs> but let's go. So properties and interfaces. Um, interfaces are nice, right? In type system, they are very understood. I think a lot of languages do that. But how we do interfacing on a property-based system that doesn't have the types or anything? And to do this example, I have something that I created for myself. It's a, a reconciler because I save my money transactions in YNAB, and I have the new bank thing. But they go out of sync very quickly. So I want to have some UI where I can see the transactions both on my replica, that's my YNAB, and on the new bank stuff and be able to compare and fix my, fix my thing. So for the UI sake, the UI doesn't care where those information are coming from, right? So we can create an interface on the UI that just says, hey, I need a list of replica transactions and I need a list of source transactions. And in each of them, I need ID, date, title, and amount. You see, it's even the same property. I don't even need to care about the difference. But on the other side, the real implementation, the real guys that do the work are resolvers like this. And one then says, yeah, I can get you the YNAB transactions. And the other one says, yeah, I can get you the new bank transactions. How we connect these words now? How can we make this API fulfill that demand? And that's quite simple. We actually use alias, right? You can just point there. You say, hey, you can convert YNAB transactions to replica transactions. For the sake of this system, they are the, this is the inform uh, relevant information you want. And then you start aliasing every property. It says, oh, yeah, the transaction on the reconciler is the same of the ID there. The date same there. The title is same there. You're just pointing it out, really connecting the dots. But it's not always so simple. For example, YNAB treats, uh, treats amounts as thousands of cents. But my system wants to deal with them as decimals. And because of that, we can use this single ATTR resolver, which pretty much is just like an alias, but it's going to go through a function during the process. So this way, you can align the properties from the data you have to the interface you need. And you do that as a third-party system writing more resolvers, so you don't have to change the sources. The sources can stay the same. And these are building blocks, like, right? You can put in and out resolvers freely. And now let's talk a bit about federation. And uh, at least for what I'm trying to say here, federation is the concept that you should be able to delegate parts of the requests uh, to some other service. And we kind of do that right now with the GraphQL implementation, right? So we have static resolvers. There are those resolvers that have fixed input and output. And we have dynamic resolvers, which are like GraphQLs, Datomic, SQLs, all those things. They can fulfill a lot of the demands, but the request for them is kind of specialized. And they depend on a context. So they are dynamic in that sense. Although we have support for that already on Python, it's a bit flawed. For example, if we integrated the GitHub GraphQL API in our system, we can run this query just fine. It will work. But let's say in, the way it works is that first, it's going to see that you are asking for something from GitHub. And then it's going to look back, because you don't want it to do one request to GraphQL for every property you need. You want to batch all the things you can get in a single request and send at once. So the way it works now is look, it looks back, find all the properties that are GraphQL, and send a single request to fulfill them. But if you are in a situation like this, you create an alias and you ask for the alias, when it does that look back, there is not going to be anything from GraphQL. Uh, and that's a detail of that current implementation. It doesn't know uh, so much about the things. So you have to do something like this. And that's totally suboptimal. The good news is that I'm currently working on a new query planner. And 
Um, I can't enter on details. I think this new query planner can get a talk on itself. But I'm just giving you that this will fix those problems. And once you have those problems fixed, then you can start doing some quite interesting things. And I have a basic example here of a, a simple app that a startup will do and start. So you create your web browser app. Um, that web browser will connect to, to the Python server. And that Python server is going to be connected to your database. And it's going to fulfill the requests. Simple. And then you add another client, like a mobile iOS client. That's fine. They can pull from the same database. All works. But later, later in the game, let's say you decided that you wanted to support offline things. So now your data now has two sources. Because the offline data needs to come from the browser or from the iOS itself. They can't come from the server because you are offline. So what you can do is you create a client parser. And in the client parser, you can implement the resolvers that deal with the client data, with the local data. But at the same time, this parser can pull the index from the server and merge those index together. So it, with the new planner, it will be able to automatically delegate that and see, oh, these properties are from this, these properties are from that. And you can keep growing like, oh, now I want to port that to the mobile. M write a client parser there and implement. You can even use the same names if you want. And same if you want to add an odd write and stuff. So and now, what about distributed architecture? And that's, I think, it's, that's something that excites me a lot. That's a possibility that will be enabled when you have this new planner. And imagine a situation like this. You have your own client parser here, and it's connecting to four different services. And this is the dream world all of them I use Python, OK? And uh, how that integration could work? Let's look inside. If you look inside, every box, each box of that is like a, uh, is like a service. So on the, on the customer service, you have the of a resolver that gets some customer data. On the order service, sorry, I'm not sure. Can you see the whole thing there? Oh, yeah, cool. Sorry, my, my screen here is on September years. Well, on the order service, uh, it has some things like you get orders or get the products of the orders, can have a bunch of, of resolvers inside of that. Then in your product service, you have resolvers that can get data about the service, about the product. And you have these third-party service can get you like the mar market price to a product giving the product UPC. So let's start connecting the dots here. So the order ID from the customer order is connected there. And then this is connected there. But that connection is wrong, right? Because this is a third-party software. They don't use your names. They are not your awesome star. They are a third-party. But you know that the UPC should mean the same because uh, in the, they say that it's the same, and you know your UPC is the same. So you can fix that just by introducing on the client parser, you can introduce an alias. And now we finish the connection between them. And now all the data can be filled. So the user can request some data like this. Like, OK, get me customer name orders. And then it says, OK, the name I get there. The orders I get there. Order it there, there. And should be able to batch this. And query there query there. And by automatically delegating, you don't, your client doesn't care about you anymore. And this is this uh, system integration level thing that I'm really excited to try at some point. So we have this. We had this thing. But why stop there? Pull some GraphQLs inside. Or pull some resolvers inside. Pull. Uh, maybe those are connected to even other parts and things. They're connected to other things. And your client on itself can be turned to a client to many other things. And what's interesting to me about this is that's a connection that has very little configuration to deal. All you have to do is connect the names. And by connecting the names, you create this graph that can fulfill the whole request for everything you need. And that's what I'm calling my maximal graph. And that's what I have to today. Thank you.